This is the California State Senate. Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California.
This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California.
This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate.
Test one, test two, test three. Good afternoon. So there's always a lesson. The lesson is this is, place has been beautifully set up for us, but they forgot new batteries. And I think that's a good reminder. Make sure you have batteries, make sure you have fresh water, uh, and a whole lot of other things um, just uh, in, for life in general. But certainly here in our community where uh, we have experienced just some extraordinary uh, challenges and disasters over the last six months. And so I want to thank uh, all of you and welcome all of you here today, as well as those who are joining us uh, via live stream. Um, and I do believe there is a, a large uh, representation out there in the ether who are uh, concerned and are participating. And I want to thank all of you who are here today uh, for joining us. I'm State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. I represent the 19th State Senate District, which is all of Santa Barbara County and all of Western Ventura County uh, through Ojai, Santa Paula, uh, Fillmore, and all the way up uh, Camarillo to the top of the Conejo grade and up in this direction. So the district's uh, only about 120 miles, um, and uh, um, every ember of that fire uh, the Thomas Fire and every incident we've had in this area is in not only the 19th Senate District, but the 37th Assembly District. So my co-chair, Assembly Member Monique Lim Limon, and I are joined at the hip, literally and figuratively. Uh, and I was thinking the other day, uh, our first bonding moment came during the time we were having those terrible rains. Uh, and we both needed to be here, so we rented a truck and drove down from Sacramento. I think it took nine and a half hours, and we were, we were stupid to do this. It was a very dangerous trip, but we needed to get home. And, and of course, we've been uh, side by side during the Thomas fire, and then, of course, the 19 debris flow and the uh, uh, holiday fire. So um, it's, it's an honor for me to be able to share the stage with her and uh, to be your, your state senator. I know we've all been through a lot, and um, hopefully we are moving out of it, but the, the fire that we had last weekend is a reminder that we must always be vigilant, that um, we are uh, only a bit of luck away from having events that are, again, gonna challenge our, our community, but we have a spirit here. I remember uh, being here about six months ago with this room filled with people who had just been through the debris flow, um, and uh, seeing us come together really is inspiring. Uh, and we have and we will continue to do so as we uh, have our hearing today. Uh, we've entitled it Vision for Santa Barbara Recovery and Rebuild, Evaluating Where We Are Now, the Long-Term Plan for Revitalizing Our Community, and Ensuring Continued Effective Collaboration Going Forward for whatever the challenges are and the disasters that may befall us. Being strong together as a community, working with our public officials and our community, uh, we will continue to overcome and uh, be strengthened uh, by the lessons that we learn. So the purpose of today's hearing is to assemble key leaders from both the local and state level uh, to update uh, this community on the efforts that are being taken in both Sacramento and uh, Santa Barbara for the long-term rebuilding and revitalization of um, the county. Um, and uh, I think that by the fact that we're here, we had an incident last Friday, our discussions about doing something that seemed appropriate after six months were made even more important uh, by this fire this past weekend, which uh, sadly took 13 homes and a number of uh, additional buildings but with, uh, without the loss of life. And that, of course, is always the critical and most important thing. And the fact that we uh, preposition that our uh, public safety, our fire departments, you know, it's lessons learned. They knew with a red flag warning that there was a real potential for fire. And there is no doubt that having these fire trucks from other parts of the state, our local folks, everybody, all hands on deck, kept that fire from getting worse than it, than it was and, and than it could have been. So with 9,000 wildfires ignited across all parts of the st state last year, which was the worst fire, uh, wildfire uh, year we've had, this year looks like it's gonna be as bad, if not worse, 
Um, we burned over uh, half a million acres of land last year, destroyed more than 10,800 structures, and uh, claimed the lives of 71 people. Um, and we, of course, here in, in this county, were uh, among the most impacted uh, communities in the state, first with the Thomas fire, which also impacted our friends and colleagues in Ventura, uh, took out about 586 homes in one strip of uh, area in Ventura, took out homes in the Ojai Valley, um, and then, of course, um, damaged uh, about 1,000 homes when we had the uh, debris flow. Um, we've had our share of problems. So um, we're here today to talk about uh, where we are in terms of that rebuild, our resiliency, what we're going to do going forward. The county has been gracious enough to give us their time to be here and the state. We also have uh, a number of people representing the state uh, who are with us. You know, the frequency of these natural disasters reflects what Governor Brown and others have been talking about as the new normal. Climate change is real. And uh, the fact that we have gone through years of drought, that our weather events have been so much more dramatic, whether it's here in California or through around the country or world, uh, we, have, we saw when we had that debris flow, the humidity um, during the fire, rather, and, and as that debris flow was uh, creating, uh, the lowest humidity rates, that's why that fire burned as it did. It, when it started, it was burning at the rate of an acre a second. Think about that, an acre a second. And the night of the debris flow, because we had prepositioned um, so many of our public safety people, 900 people uh, were saved the night of the debris flow. So we lost 23. There were 900 other people who were saved because of the work that was done in anticipation of this potential problem. We have to maintain that vigilance, and I am confident that with your help, with the help of the experts who are here, and good government, and that really is, this is government at its finest, people coming together, recognizing the challenges that we have, and working uh, together to make sure we are as protected as we possibly can. And finally, Assembly Member Limon and I, uh, after we hear from both uh, our local community where we are, and has everyone picked up a, um, an agenda so that you at least here know uh, where we're going to start, and perhaps uh, the assembly member will uh, remind everyone who is at home and not, a not uh, able to follow with the agenda, uh, who are all are going to be speaking. A at the end, uh, assembly member Limon and I are going to follow up with legislative update on the work that we have been doing and the budget efforts. You know, part of the challenge when you start rebuilding is where's the money? And of course, we'll have someone talking about the insurance challenges for private property owners, but the state has really tried to step in. The federal government has stepped in to help us uh, with that uh, uh, recovery and rebuild, uh, and yet there's a lot more to do. So with that, I want to hand uh, the microphone with new batteries over to Assembly Member Limon for opening remarks. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, there's a, a number of you that are here that have been in touch with us throughout this, um, I, I think, process throughout the moments that our communities have been living. When we decided to move forward with having this hearing, we did it with the purpose of wanting to bring a little of the work that we do in Sacramento to you locally. Um, we've had hearings in Sacramento related to natural disasters, to response, to recovery, and some of you in the room have been able to join us for those. Um, but we wanted to ensure that you had the opportunity to be here to listen and that we had the opportunity to hear from you. And really the goal of this hearing is simply that. Um, this will be part of our legislative record. Um, it's being recorded, it's being live televised, it's, it's being uh, televised on, online. Uh, and additionally, each of us in our respective legislative houses chairs a committee that directly addresses the issues that we have lived, that we continue to live, and may continue to live in the future um, in, in terms of natural disasters and response and recovery. I do want to recognize, um, as has been said, that the work we do, we don't do alone. Um, we do collaboratively with individuals, with entities, with bodies of government, um, with private and public partnerships to understand how we better address the needs. 
Um, I, there is a representative here from Salud Carbajal's office, Chris Hansen, um, who is here representing our Congress member. Thank you for being here. Um, County Supervisor Doss Williams, who is here, and Gwen um, Lurie from the school board, who you'll hear from um, in, in just moments. And so these are some of the elected offices as well as a, a lot of uh, public safety offices that you'll hear from, but I wanted to recognize that the work we're doing is not done alone, and this is part of one part of many conversations that happen. Uh, we don't expect that today we will walk away with all the answers or solutions um, to, these, to the magnitude of problems that we've seen, but we do expect that this is one piece of a puzzle that gets us uh, to a better solution, to a better understanding of the issues that our community is going um, through and the ways that we can address them. Within our roles as in the state, we have some capacity to address them, but that's not the only area or only space where these issues can be addressed. And so I want to recognize that. Thank you for being here and thank you for being a part of this conversation. Um, and also let you know that this is, uh, this may be the first formal hearing that we are having here, but it is not our only opportunity to engage. We will continue to have these conversations. Both of our offices are open to continue the discussion. And um, by the end of the hearing, you will also under better, hopefully better understand where our office can be of help. Um, with that, I do want to invite two people to uh, just give welcoming remarks. Um, two people who have been uh, really key in, in allowing us to be here today. Um, and the first is Anthony Rainey, from, who is the uh, superintendent uh, for our Montecito Union School District, who I've had the pleasure of working with, um, to give some opening remarks. And then we will move over to our county CEO, uh, Mona Mayasato. Thank you very much. Once again, my name is Anthony Rainey, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Montecito Union School. And this is our auditorium. We're happy to have you here. You know, we have a few different mottos at Montecito Union School that we use. And two of them I'd like to share with you. One of them is uh, stronger together. And the second one is we got this. And during the debris flow and the Thomas fire, I think this community had both those mottos as a community mottos as well. We all did our part. We're stronger together. We're all, we all did our part during the disaster and then in the aftermath. And here at Montecito Union School, we certainly tried to do our part to be stronger together. We were the site for water distribution, the site for sandbag filling. We've been the site for community meetings and insurance meetings and meetings with contractors because we feel that a strong Montecito makes a strong Montecito Union School. And we also have the motto of, we got this. And as dark as things got, we thought that um, everybody in this community remained optimistic. And I hope that today we'll continue to uh, look at the stark realities, but also be optimistic because Montecito has a bright future. I also want to, am really happy to be here today to be able to thank Senator Jackson and Assemblyman Limon for their amazing leadership. If we can thank them, please, for everything that they've done. Thank you. And specifically for public schools, both of them really went to bat for us in Sacramento to get a, uh, a property tax backfill from the state of California to make public school districts whole, both in this fiscal year and the next fiscal year, because along with everything else, property taxes are, are likely to go down and that's gonna affect our revenue. But these folks up here on the dais really made sure that we'd be whole while we're we in the rebuilding process. So again, thank you for, for that leadership. Um, and finally, I have some very important announcements where the bathrooms are. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you need to use the facilities, come out here to our beautiful courtyard and take the ramp or the steps downstairs and you'll see bathrooms clearly marked. There's water bottles um, in the front and there's a water bottle fill, uh, filling station around the back in case you need more. So uh, once again, welcome to Montecito Union School and here's to making Montecito ever stronger. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mona Miyasato, the County Executive Officer for the County of Santa Barbara. And again, welcome. And I also want to thank uh, Assemblymember Limon and Senator Jackson. Um, they were with us even before the debris flow. As the Thomas Fire was approaching our boundaries and our borders, they were with us, communicating with us, asking what we needed in preparation. So we appreciate their time. They were continuing to lend their assistance and their staff's assistance to us throughout the whole period. 
And many people don't know that they were actually with us almost daily, um, either in, uh, in person or on the phone in our EOC during that time, as was our first district supervisor, um, Doss Williams, and members of Supervisor Car uh, Congressman Carvall's staff. <coughs> and they were with us on the phone or in person every day in the weeks that followed and the days that followed to help us and make sure that we were getting what we were needed. And I have proof of that because I have not lost the five pounds I gained from all the donuts they brought in every <laughs> single time they came in. So thank you for that. Um, what you're going to hear today is our approach, the, the Montecito way of recovery. And um, all disasters are local. And I think what this has shown us is that this has really been an experience of neighbors working with neighbors and residents working with county government. And we know we can't do it alone. And we've relied on and continue to rely on the smarts and the skills and the vigor and the energy of Montecito residents, philanthropists, and nonprofits to make all of this recovery work for all of us. Um, it's also been led by our chair of the board, Doss Williams, who he and his little girl, who you see at all the different community meetings, have been propelling us forward and making sure that this community is getting all the resources that the county can bring to bear. Um, what you're going to hear on our disaster recovery plan that's going to be presented to you by Matt Pontus, uh, my assistant county executive officer, who I've dedicated to the recovery effort um, for the last <clears throat> six months and will continue, is about our plan, which emphasizes resiliency and understanding the uniqueness of Montecito. The plan's focus is on the fundamental things that county government can do and can bring to bear within our purview that we can actually catalyze. And it contains an array of actions that Matt will discuss, but it's basically focused on how to reduce future risks, how do we prepare for the next disaster, and how can we enable residents to rebuild as quickly as possible. And some of you were at the meeting yesterday discussing um, the new FEMA maps. The County Board of Supervisors adopted this plan on June 5th unanimously, and our county recovery team meets every week to drive that plan and make sure we're meeting all those tasks and activities on time. This is still one of the highest priorities for county government, above other things, not just for our chair, Doss Williams, who's been leading these efforts, but for all the county. So thank you again, and with that, I believe the first panel is ready to go, and I'll hand it over to, I believe, Matt Pontus once uh, introductions are made. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your efforts. <clears throat> Sorry about the donuts, but they really were good. Uh, and, and certainly the work that everybody did. You know, a fire burned for 40 days. Uh, really quite extraordinary, unlike any other fire I think that California's had, and certainly the largest wildfire in the history of this state. So we are going to go to our first panel uh, our current, uh, on the current status of the Discovery Recovery Plan. And for those at home who don't have the agenda, we're going to hear first from Matt Pontus, the Director of Recovery for Santa Barbara County, as uh, Chief uh, Executive Officer Miyasato mentioned. We're then going to hear from Gwyn Lurie, uh, who is a representative of the Partnership for Resilient Communities in Montecito, which is a sort of a public-private partnership, a very interesting, I think, creative approach to trying to provide additional insight into ways that we can recover and, and go on. And then we have Chief uh, Eric Peterson, who is the Chief of the Santa Barbara County Fire Department, who will give us his uh, views. Uh, he's been involved in a number of these disasters and has some suggestions and visions that I think will be helpful. And then Kate Wiebe with the Montecito Center for Preparedness, Recovery, and Rebuilding. Uh, many of you uh, have seen her there. This is an extraordinary community effort to try to make sure that everyone who's been impacted has a place to go uh, and can get the assistance they need uh, during these difficult times. So with that, Matt, if you'd like to go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate that, Senator Jackson. Again, I'm Matt Pontus, uh, Director of Recovery here, and I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. We have an action-packed um, agenda for you, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I really appreciated some of the, uh, the comments that the representative from the superintendent's office talked about when they talked about stronger together, because as we look at this recovery plan, this is something that the county could absolutely not do alone. It took a lot of work from a lot of our partners. Um, the Partnership for Resilient Communities provided an expert to us. 
that had worked for FEMA and Cal OES that helped us align all of our actions toward Cal OES templates and FEMA templates so that we were sure that we didn't miss anything as we tried to figure out this incredible puzzle and provide the community of Montecito with all of the tools that they needed to help getting back on their feet. So with that, the Recovery Strategic Plan really is our efforts that pull together all the different disciplines and it is not one of those static documents that lives on a shelf somewhere. This is actually version 61 of this plan and the short couple months that we've had it because it has changed so much over time. And when new items come in, we bring them in, we solve them like solving puzzles, and then we, we continue to work toward them. So based upon those kinds of ideas, the plan had to be flexible, it had to be very efficient with our, with our staff time, and absolutely had data-driven decisions being made. We had the end goal of always headed towards a more resilient Montecito community. Next slide, please. The plan components had eight sections. A storm preparation and evacuation portion, a long-term flood control mitigation section, private property rebuilding, debris on private property and what to do there, financial impacts and an economic recovery section, infrastructure repair and modifications, a natural resources and cultural section, and a community engagement portion. Next slide. With that, there were seven main plan objectives that the plan attempted to achieve. To identify those issues most important to the recovery and develop a plan to, to solve the issues. Ensure the public is informed on the county's efforts in the support of Montecito's recovery through all means available. And that really does mean all means available. Other state, federal, and private partnerships all along the way. To engage the public and our elected officials to determine the best solutions necessary for recovery. Next slide. To utilize public and private partnerships in all of our recovery efforts, to work with nonprofits, to provide assistance where the government services were not able to or we didn't have enough of them. To continue to prepare communities for future storms and evacuations with the best data available. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that tonight. As we look towards another fall and winter, uh, rainy season. We wanted to have the most information available and make sure that we're clearly communicating those evacuations. Next slide. The uh, last plan objective was to develop plans and strategies that address the storm preparation and evacuation for the next two to five years until our vegetation regrows. We have mitigation efforts for future debris flows and ensure we have a rebuilding process for all the different categories of damaged and destroyed properties. And that we're communicating these strategies to the community. Next slide. I'm gonna go through a couple issues. The first one, storm preparation and evacuation. And I should note that this report really is a very thick report that I'll show you the web address at the very end where you can go and, and see more depth of the report. And what we're doing today is just a really high level um, topic overview. Uh, each of these sections has multiple pages and multiple portions. Um, under storm preparation and evacuation, our status locally here is that we're finalizing our criteria for evacuation thresholds. And we know that um, that is really important into how many folks are going to be evacuating this winter. So we have a lot of resources focused on, again, the data behind those decisions and a team of public safety professionals and scientists that are working together to, uh, to work on that storm preparation. We're updating the risk map that has a debris flow uh, portion of it, as you're all aware of the hazard maps. And we have a contractor that's helping us through that. We're also gonna have, starting in September, a large outreach and education plan, where we will be back here, hopefully, again, um, uh, many times before the rainy season. Next slide. This slide should look familiar to a lot of you, and this was the 72-hour storm evacuation timeline that we used last year. And so we're gonna be revisiting that timeline for this year. We're gonna be adjusting it. We're gonna be making sure that the things that worked really well continue, 
and that those areas that we need to improve on, that we're going to improve on. We had a lot of comments over the last six months on things that we could do better in this area, and we are taking them all under advisement. Next slide. Under the long-term flood control mitigations, we have a consultant that's working on debris basin modifications. We have Army Corps of Engineers that's been analyzing our basin and our channel capacities. And we have a whole bunch of hazard mitigation grant program. That's that acronym HMGP up there. Um, and the NOI is Notice of Intent. And these are grants that we're going to be going after that uh, help us fund uh, flood control mitigations in the future. And we have a lot of information that will be coming out on that in the months ahead. And we'll be back and forth in front of our Board of Supervisors in late August to discuss some of those uh, mitigations. Uh, among those uh, grant applications, all, they also include a future disposal sites, so we have a place to put the mud and debris and sort it out should we get further mud and debris flows, and property acquisition for floodies and flood easements. Next slide, please. Private property rebuilding. This is one of the most important issues that we took on over the last few months. And what we tried to do was put everything we needed to, to put it together to make it possible for property owners to make informed decisions about their rebuilding options. So this included identifying and categorizing all impacted properties. Our planning and Devel development department put together an interactive map that depicts all of the different um, statuses of those properties. Our Board of Supervisors, led by Supervisor Doss Williams, adopted a like-for-like -like ordinance that was a little more in tune and flexible with the type of conditions that exist here in Montecito after the debris flow. Our Coastal Commission adopted that like-for-like -like ordinance. We, our Board of Supervisors, adopted the FEMA map that we talked about last night here at the community meeting uh, to help give folks um, a better understanding of the possibilities with flood based upon the current condition of the vegetation and the hills uh, behind us here. And we have set up case managers and a local team of architects and engineers to work together with homeowners to hopefully provide for as many options and as many different kind of ideas as possible that help inform them about their decisions. Next slide, please. Issue four was debris on private property. And as you're all acutely aware, this has been an issue that we've been struggling with and, and working on for several months. Uh, we're still maintaining the materials exchange website. We've had a lot of really positive uh, feedback on that, that uh, a lot of homeowners were using that and being able to um, remove boulders and rocks and, and soil from that. Our household waste, um, hazardous waste, household hazardous waste pickups, we have completed two of those in the community that remove those items from, um, from the areas that, uh, that were hazardous in nature. We have ongoing work to try and secure disposal sites so that we can quickly move and uh, debris should we get future uh, storm events. Next slide. Issue five in our recovery strategic plan dealt more with the financial impacts and the economic recovery of our community. We have a team of folks that are focused on full cost recovery uh, through the Senator and Assembly Members' offices. They've been instrumental in helping us with the property tax backfill from the state of California that is critically important in uh, giving us the tools we have, that we need here locally to do some of these hazard mitigation projects and other things. We have 13 hazard mitigation grant projects that are submitted to a total ask of $52 million, but that it comes with a local match of over $12 million. Uh, we have state and federal level coordination of several different kind of matching funds that we're working through right now. And we have long-term funding sources needed for the capital and the maintenance. We have a flood control district, and uh, certainly this event has overwhelmed that district, but. Uh, but we've got some ideas and some other CDBG, uh, community development block grants, and other tools that, uh, that we're hoping that we can use and, and leverage some of our other resources with. Next slide. 
Issue six in the recovery strategic plan was the infrastructure repair and modifications. And this is an area where we've listed just a few projects here. Most of the projects that we've been working on are bridge improvements and culverts and drainages, drainage facilities, to improve those to not only build back what was destroyed during the one night event, but also enhance them so that they can be more effective should we get additional uh, debris flow and um, high intensity rains. We've also done other hazard mitigation projects for Bella Vista and uh, Lisos Drive culvert replacements. And, uh, and again, with the, the goal to restore those facilities to pre-storm conditions. Next slide, please. Issue seven focused on our natural and cultural resources. As you're aware, and those of you that have been in Montecito or lived here for a long time, uh, it looks quite different in many of the areas across Montecito. So we've been in discussions on engaging the community on different kinds of ideas and potential projects to help restore some of the natural or cultural resources uh, along the watersheds. We've also been in discussions recently with Santa Barbara Land Trust, looking for opportunities to collaborate together to, uh, to provide for some areas that, uh, that help both achieve a setback from the water courses or allow us to do additional uh, debris basin protection measures. Next slide, please. This chapter focused on our community engagement. One of the, I think, best things that we were able to do is to work collaboratively, collaboratively with the Orfila Foundation and a whole lot of nonprofits to establish a Montecito Center that acted like a hub and still continues to operate as a hub in the community where folks can go in and uh, talk one-on-one -on -one with a person about the issues or the questions that they have, and it's not just calling some phone number that connects with somebody uh, that they can't see and talk to. This, this Montecito Center has facilitated a lot of outreach to a lot of impacted residents, and we've also engaged the philanthropic sector, uh, and a lot of nonprofits, as you all are aware, have come together to really um, address all of the community's needs. We've also had a large showing of emotional support by 805 Hope and the additional groups that have been focused on community wellness across the community. Next slide. As hopefully all of you are aware, we've had a communication um, endeavor uh, across the entire uh, Thomas Fire and 1-9 Debris Flow and throughout recovery. And our readysbc.org website uh, has been up there where we post all of our newest information. We, we take questions um, and hopefully have organized that in a way that is clear and easy to read and have included newsletters and other things for folks out there. Next slide, please. Ongoing needs. We continue to have ongoing needs as we continue to move through the different phases of the recovery. Continuing of the disaster declaration at the state level and a linkage to those future events is going to be critical as we are still under threat, much unlike a lot of the other disasters that happened in the last year across the state where there was a threat, something happened, and they've moved into recovery. Um, this, this particular event has challenged us and we still uh, have uh, risk based upon the winter ahead. We're still going to be asking for some assistance with TOT backfill in the future. We have about a $2.5 million loss. We're looking and working with a lot of different partners and companies on improved alerting systems and utilizing the best technology available. And also through regulatory flexibility as we address some of these mitigations and debris basins and some of these other um, technology solutions across Montecito we are hoping to get some flexibility on regulatory um, conditions. So that is the end of our recovery strategic plan and hoping either now or later we can address some questions that the, the group may have. So next I would like to introduce Gwen. Oh, question. I think, I think if we may just take questions toward the end because otherwise we're not gonna get through this uh, 
program, and we want to hear from everyone. So save that program. I've got a couple, too. And if we could ask you no more than 10 minutes so that we are, uh, we didn't prepare dinner for everybody. So we want to get people out of here so they can go home. But Gwen, anxious to hear what you have to say, okay. so if you could. Thank you, Senator Jackson. Uh, Mona, I, I was thinking as you were talking about the five pounds you've gained that I was started to wonder about the environmental impact of the collective weight we've all gained <laughs> and thinking that maybe we need to put together like a community uh, health program after we get through with our resiliency plan. Um, so, I, you know, over the last few weeks, by most of you I'm sure I've been watching with great interest the rescuing of these um, boys in Thailand in this cave and, um, you know, I think there's some real parallels here. There, we're in murky waters and uh, there's not enough oxygen. Uh, and we need guidance uh, to get us to a safer place. And I, I just want to say that we're so grateful to have such incredible leadership um, in the state, uh, Senator Jackson and, and um, um, Assemblymember Limon, and in our county, Doss and, and Mona, and uh, in the um, CEO's office. We, we really, uh, I've personally been so impressed and so heartened by the coming together of this community. So thank you so much for that. Um, I was asked uh, to represent my group, which is the Partnership for Resilient Communities. And let me just give you a little background on how we came together. Uh, the core team of my group uh, is um, Brett Matthews, who is the former, actually, president of the school board of Montecito Union School and is an entrepreneur and kind of expert in public-private partnerships. Uh, uh, Joe Cole, the chair of the um, planning commission and a land use lawyer in uh, Montecito. Uh, Pat McElroy, former Santa Barbara City fire chief, Les Firestein, contractor, builder, innovator, happens to be my husband, but I would have married him again after I've seen the kind of effort he's put into this endeavor. Um, Mary Rose, who is a public policy consultant and has been an amazing partner in this, Alix Mattingly, another local person. And really what happened is after the debris flow, we all came together and like so many people, we were looking for our lane um, of where to help. And we went to the county um, and basically said, how can we help you manage this thing that none of us has, have ever seen before? We were all in over our heads, and we basically said, we want to help you make our community as safe as possible and put together a plan so that we can emerge, to quote the <laughs> $6 million man, better, stronger, faster, um, and really get through this as a more resilient community and not, here's a double negative, not not be able to do things because any one branch of government didn't have the bandwidth or the money to do it. So that was really our goal was just what can we do now to make us more safe, to make the mountain more safe, and that's um, really where this all began. Uh, we started by engaging leaders, looking around, because we all know that as much as this was a new thing for our community, we're not the first community to experience a severe um, event that, you know, that has to do with wildland-urban interface. And, um, and so there are other people in Switzerland, in Washington State, in, you know, all over our country and the world, in Japan, who have gone through these sorts of things, and there are experts out there, including local experts at the Bren School, you know, geologists and people who have been thinking about these things forever, and um, who really had important information to teach us about technology that's out there and things that we can um, do now. We engaged immediately James Lee Witt, who is the former head of FEMA, um, and previously worked with the local partnership that built the county's um, Aware and Prepare program um, and the Emergency Operations Center. We hired um, <coughs> Admiral Thad Allen um, from the Coast Guard who had real experience in dealing with um, these kinds of natural disasters 
and we hired David Fukutomi who, um, um, to work as a bridge between our group and the county. Um, and David uh, is the former deputy director of Cal OES and former senior official at FEMA, so he had some real expertise to bring to um, these issues as well. Um, and of course, you know, our most important partners have been the county and the state. Um, CEO Mona Maesato, who has been really from the very beginning, and I'm gonna name some of these names, then I'll quickly get to what we're actually doing. But the fact that these people who were so overwhelmed opened up their arms to a partnership and really um, welcomed the help and you know, joined arms with us was so impressive to us and heartening. And I, I just can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Um, Matt Pontus, who um, was supposed to be less interesting so that I would sound more interesting, but that didn't work out. Um, <laughs> Senator Jackson, um, Assemblywoman Lamone, um, both of um, these leaders, state leaders and their staffs have been, in, from day one, we're saying, you know, what are you thinking? Like out there, open to ideas, wanted to do everything they could to support this community and that's been amazing. Um, Supervisor Williams who has, I know, lost so much sleep from the day this happened, you know, wanting to be there for this community and wanting to, um, you know, solve a problem that seemed unsolvable. So, um, you know, that's been incredible. Um, the Montecito Association, Bob Hazard's writing on this issue for the Montecito Journal has been so helpful to all of us. Um, Su Superintendent Raina, you have opened the school in a way that I know was so, we're all so grateful for. Um, great support from FEMA, all of this. And so really, um, our partnership, let me just tell you sort of some of the things that we're looking at um, that we've been discussing with the county and trying to do, because really we want to get some mitigation up on the mountain before, you know, December, before the next rains, because that's what we're all concerned about. We're all concerned about, you know, temporary solutions before the natural regrowth can happen on the mountain. And some of the um, technologies that we're looking at are, um, monitors that can give us real-time data about things that are happening up on the mountain. Um, one of the um, technologies that seem to be used around the world often and most effectively are debris nets that um, I happened to be in Switzerland for a conference in June and saw them all over the mountains in Switzerland and um, th they, they actually have saved lots of property and lots of lives around the world. So we're looking at um, doing temporary netting um, that is environmentally vetted, that has been, as I said, used all over the world, and hopefully the first canyon we'll be able to put that in is the Buena Vista Canyon, because that canyon does not have a debris basin at the bottom of it. So we're hoping to be able to get this done. And again, the county and the state has been so, um, working with us hand in hand and trying to do everything we could to we, they can to get sort of emergency stays on um, you know certain approvals we would have to get to do this um, in a more permanent way or if we had eternal time to get it done um, the other things we're looking at is trying to help the county um, enhance the existing debris basin network um, that we have to help accelerate regrowth. And ultimately, what we all know is that the entire problem is a water problem. And I know all of Montecito is very focused on um, really wanting to solve or all of the state of California, <laughs> but certainly Montecito is very focused on how to solve this problem. Um, and there are many things that we're looking at doing to facilitate better ongoing hydration of the mountain, um, certainly if pot growers could do it, we can do it. Um, uh, and uh, so that, you know, that involves better water catchment, irrigation, 
innovative ways to get water on the mountain, um, like things like dew harvesting and um, atmospheric water and other things that we're just considering because we sort of feel like we are limited only by the boundaries of our imagination and our imaginations and um, you know the partnerships that we're able to form. And you know, one of the groups that I didn't mention who have been so incredibly, um, well, we all know how amazing the, you know, the firefighters and law enforcement in Santa Barbara County have been just unbelievable heroes in this whole thing and have really stepped outside of, I think everyone stepped outside of their comfort zone and have sort of you know, come to the table to have the bigger conversations about how everything impacts everything else. And so we're so grateful to have such amazing um, leadership um, on that front. And um, I think I will leave it there except to say that, um, you know, the habitat uh, you, in terms of the state, and we appreciate not just everyone's talked about the backfill, and I know we're sitting in this auditorium and our school district appreciates so much um, the backfill, uh, but the economic implications we know are gonna be more than a year. And so we're really hoping to find longer term solutions um, as the mountain heals and our economy heals. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And we do have um, uh, sort of a brochure at the back about what we're doing and we're setting up a website to um, sort of continue to update with ongoing technologies we're looking at and, and projects we're endeavoring to pursue and um, we're also doing this with the help of some very generous people in this community who have written some very generous checks to fund what we're trying to do. So that's kind of the private piece of this partnership is, you know, we're trying to pull our personal weight in getting us to higher ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. And I suspect if people have some good ideas that you are, Gwen, your folks are receptive if somebody uh, has a suggestion that you might be interested in considering, they, they should con contact you on that as well. I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep. Um, we're beyond being receptive. We need, we have had, I named the kind of five or six core members of this group, but we have had so much input from members of this community. The resources that we have more than anything in this community are human resources, and it is unbelievable the expertise and the creative and strategic thinking that is going on in this community and the people who have come together to sit with us and help us think these things through. And I think I mentioned the Montecito Association is one of the groups that's been so supportive of the work we're doing and wanting to link arms with us. And so, yes, absolutely, we are beyond open to input. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Chief? Well, thank you. I appreciate being here. I uh, appreciate the invitation. I've also gained a lot of weight during this whole thing. <laughs> it's any consolation. Uh, I wanted to talk about some things that are working in our favor during this whole endeavor, some challenges we're having moving forward, and we're going to continue to have to some degree, and a to-do list. Um, I'll start with the things working in our favor. Uh, I've worked in this organization. I've lived in town my whole life. And I've never seen the fire departments in this op area get along the way they get along <coughs> right now. Our, our, uh, our coordination and communication with each other, uh, the relationships that we have with each other, uh, honestly has never been better than it is right now. And I think some of that is because of the personalities that are involved. A lot of it is because of the challenges that we've all had to face together and the experiences we've gained. But that is a, uh, that's a, uh, I think part of it too is Pat McElroy is here. He was this old city, uh, city, recently retired city fire chief. We used to attend bar together. That might have something to do with it. Um, but we have a really good unified uh, group of fire chiefs and fire departments here in this county right now. Um, Public-private partnerships. This partnership for the resilient for resilient communities is is really just an incredible example and very unique to our county. Um, 
the, the, the public sector and the private sector working together and helping each other out, uh, it's a really encouraging sign when you see things like that just springing up out of nowhere, and I find that to be extremely encouraging. Uh, quick government solutions. Uh, let's face it, government typically is not particularly nimble. Um, we have really nice examples recently of the government acting quickly uh, to make real differences on the, in the field and on the ground. Uh, Senator Jackson's recent effort and, and uh, Assemblymember Lamone's recent effort to uh, lobby the governor to add additional monies for the pre-positioning of fire and EMS resources in front of predicted weather, weather events um, made a major impact on this holiday fire that we recently had just last weekend. Uh, we were actually the first uh, agent, we were the first fire where these funds were utilized um, in this unique fashion and we met the thresholds that were set down by CAL FIRE. Our, our, uh, I should also say that our relationship with CAL FIRE and with our, our federal partners has never been stronger also. We have Tom Porter from CAL FIRE here with us. Um, we met the thresholds and we were able to pre-position five resources, five, five fire engines, a strike team essentially, that we would not have had otherwise, uh, put them at the corner of Hollister and um, Turnpike, and they were there for two hours before the holiday fire broke, and they were at work uh, literally within minutes of, of, of the fire starting. So that is an example of government being nimble and making a real uh, solid example. So we, that I think is extremely encouraging. Um, we have an engaged community, obviously. Uh, this Montecito Recovery Center that the county is putting out there. Again, I've been here for 32 years almost, and I was here for the paint fire. I was here for Jesusita tea. Um, I don't remember the county being, leaning this far forward um, on a recovery effort uh, ever before. And, you know, our, my CEO, Mona, has given up half her staff. She's having to do a lot of Matt Pontus' work uh, <laughs> lately. Uh, but I, I, I think those are very encouraging things. Um, so those are good things. Uh, the challenges that we're having moving forward, at the most, we have about a month to do fire prevention and any kind of substantive fuel management um, because of this climate change. Um, we literally just don't have the time that we used to. We used to have sort of a semi-well-defined fire season. Uh, Steve Oaks, our fire marshal, is in the back. When we came on together, when we came on, there was a fire season, and there was a non-fire season. And non-fire season is when you did all your training, you did all your fire, your, your, your fuel management. Um, and we don't have that kind of time anymore. And, and I, in my opinion, the fire service needs to adapt to that, and we're still in the, in the process of trying to do that. Um, I should also say that when I speak, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for all of the fire service. I'm not just speaking as a county fire chief. We have Chip Hickman here, um, Kevin Taylor, Travis is here from, the, from, from Montecito Fire Department. I, I think they'd all agree with the things that I'm saying. Um, we have a difficult time getting, getting this work done because on top of the fact that we're always on fire, it seems like, uh, the demand for mutual aid resources out of our county uh, is extremely strong. Uh, because we ask for so much help here locally, we are duty bound to provide help and provide mutual aid for out of county. And in fact, when this holiday fire broke, we had a strike team out of county and, it, and uh, I think Montecito had some people out also. So it's really a year round issue that we are still coming to grips with and we have more work to do. Um, we have less time to do environmental review for uh, fuel management projects. Uh, there's some misinformation out there that, uh, that I think is a, proposes, didn't used to pose as big a challenge as it, as it does now, but it poses a bigger challenge now. Um, manage burns and fuel breaks are, are tools that we need as, as fire departments and firefighters. And when there's misinformation out there about the efficiency or the effectiveness of those tools, um, it makes our job harder. And uh, I find it personally offensive. Um, we would not have been able to stop the Thomas fire uh, without the good work that Montecito did providing the fuel breaks and the thinning around the back of Montecito. That is what stopped that fire and another fuel break running up to Gibraltar Road. Um, we could not have put 400 fire trucks and 1,000 firefighters or 
more than more more firefighters even than that up here to stop this thing. Unfortunately, we're unable to save the watershed. Um, convincing the public that when we say this is the new normal, we really mean it. Um, I don't want to sound gloom and doom, but when we say this is the new normal, what that really means to us as firefighters is this is not a hump we're going to get over. This this is this is this is reality now. We're not going to get over this. It's not going to get better. And so as a community and as a fire service, we need to adapt to that. That's a challenge. Um, it's very difficult to coordinate local, state, and federal landowners, uh, ranchers, farmers, the environmental community, elected officials, uh, in time to do substantive fuel management projects. It's really, really difficult. It was difficult in the old days before it got like it is now. Um, and it's even more difficult now, and that's something I, I'll mention a little bit later here. Learning from history, I, I, I think that we really, especially here in Santa Barbara County, we need to learn from history. Um, in 1990, I was, I was here three years as a firefighter, and we had the Painted Cave Fire, and very similar conditions that we had at the Holiday Fire. Uh, what we keep learning is that these fires uh, they like to start up in the mountains. They like to run down into populated areas and uh, take homes and kill people. They run back up in the hills at night, and then they run back down the next day. It happened during the Tea Fire. It happened during the Hesacita Fire. But what is happening now, and I think what we really need to be aware of uh, and conscious of, is the interval between those events used to be five to ten years. Um, now, if we get weather, generally speaking, we're going to get a fire. Uh, the interval between those large catastrophic events is increasing, and we need to adapt to that. We need to take substantive action. So uh, here's my, here's my to-do list. In my opinion, we need a countywide, I don't know if this is the correct terminology or what we're even going to call this thing, but I believe that we need a countywide fuel management working group comprised of all those people and all those members of organizations that I just mentioned that need to be coordinated in order to get any work done. Um, we need to get those people, the environmental community, elected officials, state, federal, and local fire agencies, and we need to get a plan together with the priority being we need a front country fuel break in this, in this town. We need to, to put some form of a fuel break that runs from the good work that Montecito already did all the way out to behind Goleta. Uh, it can take the form of actual managed, actual fuels removed, either through hand crews, goats, mechanical means, um, or it can take the, the form of agriculture. Uh, you know, I, I think there are friends of ours in the agriculture community who would, who would hate to hear me say that, but avocados and ag belts uh, act as big hit heat sinks, and they they take up a lot of embers. You, you know, when we had the Sherpa fire, um, the avocado orchards out there went a long way towards saving Goleta from 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 catastrophic uh, loss. So we need to we need to connect the dots in the front country, or we are just going to be, in my opinion, faced with this problem over and over again. It's a heavy lift. Uh, there's a lot of assets. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, apple carts that, that uh, will be upset in the process, but I think until we do something uh, on that scale, we are going to continue to see these problems. And then finally, I have to throw this in there, we need to unify our dispatch services in this county. Um, right now in this county, we have five dispatch centers. It's not unified. We respond on most of the time different frequencies. It creates problems for us on small scale emergencies and particularly in large scale emergencies. Um, during the debris flow and during the Thomas fire, we had difficulties because we were not responding on the same frequency oftentimes. We were, our, our mobile data computers on our fire trucks weren't saying the same thing. So the situational awareness that responding resources had going into these large incidents was not as good as it could have been, and it's a problem. We are far too forward thinking of a county and of a community to have an ununified dispatching environment. It's something we absolutely need to fix. I'm working with my CEO, uh, Mona Miyasato. Doss Williams just left. They're aware of the problem. We're looking at active uh, solutions. Matt Pontus is part of the, part of the team. Um, but that's a big one on the to-do list, facing these major catastrophes as we move forward. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chief. We've written it down, both of us, so thank you. And so people aren't too discouraged. We are actually moving on those uh, levels, and we'll talk about that a little later. Thank you. And now, uh, um, Katie, uh, Kate, would you share yeah. with us what's going on? If you could keep it under 10 minutes, that'd yeah. be great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm Kate Wiebe. I am the director of the Institute for Collective Trauma and Growth, and we have been um, working for uh, six years now in disasters and long-term uh, recovery efforts around the country, and we happen to be based here, and so we're immediately responsive and, um, and created a local project that we're calling the Riviera Care Center, and we set up offices in the Montecito Center. And I also serve as the long-term recovery uh, group chair, and so in that role, I've been working very closely with Ben Romo and um, other county representatives, uh, um, especially as we've seen how uh, helpful and successful the Montecito Center has been. Um, this collaborative effort has really, um, and, and the hub that Matt talked about, has really helped to create kind of a one-stop shop that people could go to for the wide range of needs that um, are part of the long-term recovery effort. And so that, this collaboration is not going to end anytime soon, and we'll be together at least through um, the next evacuation season, so at least through March. And we have started conversations um, about the possibility of remaining in the same location uh, as we are right now. And so if that changes at all, we will for sure update the public um, as soon as possible. Um, and right now, some of the, the reason that we are forecasting that way is because um, while the Montecito Center was effective immediately, um, everyone processes trauma and goes through their own um, sense of disaster at their own pace. And so while many people uh, sought out resources right away, there are people who are just starting to come to seek out services right now. They're just starting to realize um, that maybe they weren't um, as insured as they thought they were, or, um, or their uh, rebuilding efforts are costing way more than they thought. Um, They're just starting to feel some of the impact of the emotional and, and spiritual and psychological impacts. Um, they are just starting to uh, recognize some of the longer term impacts on their businesses and so um, we have services at the Montecito Center to address that wide range of needs. So. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much um, and again we'll have questions at the end if we could call up our second panel now. Thank you folks you really have uh, done an amazing job. Let's give them a round of applause. And so our next panel is um, Eric Alamaro with the um, Cal OES, that's the Office of Emergency Services, who have been uh, sort of helping to coordinate these efforts from the state level, um, providing money and resources and leadership. And um, then I'm going to pass this back to my colleague to identify the next members. We also uh, have uh, Chief Tom Porter who is here uh, joining us from the Southern Region. Um, she's a Southern Region Chief for CAL FIRE, who we've worked uh, very closely with, as well as Dave Edwards from, uh, he's Bureau Chief of the Claims Service Bureau in the Consumer Service Division for California's Department of Insurance. This panel um, is, again, focused on some of the efforts that the state has engaged in in response um, to the natural disasters and um, the post-natural disaster situations. So we will start um, with Eric Lamoureux. Um, I do want to note that um, we do have someone who's keeping time in case you need any suggestions who's sitting here in the front row um, and will flag just um, kind of the minute warnings for us. Um, so please. Uh. Well, thank you very much to the members, Senator, for having us here today. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of build upon some comments that have already been made. Uh, there's some areas that have been touched on where uh, through the legislative action and the governor's action, we've got funding to support uh, our programs ahead of events. Sorry about that, is that better? Yeah. So I wanna reinforce some of the points that have been made um, in terms of uh, some of the funding that's been uh, provided by the legislature and the governor to support 
uh, resource deployments ahead of events as well as to look at hazard mitigation. Um, we've certainly at the Governor's Office of Emergency Services learned a tremendous amount um, through the events of 2017. Uh, obviously here, uh, first and foremost, is the Thomas Fire and the 1-9 debris flow. But unfortunately across California, 2017 was a, a really catastrophic year from the uh, significant flooding events we had throughout California at the beginning of the year, uh, our crisis at the Oroville, Lake Oroville facility, and then bookending with the uh, uh, events throughout October, December, and into January. Uh, from October through December, unfortunately, throughout California, we lost 11,000 homes and businesses throughout all of these events. Um, and as Senator Jackson highlighted earlier, tremendous uh, and unacceptable loss of life across those events. Um, locally, we have continued to remain engaged uh, here in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties and, and throughout this region in supporting the significant debris removal operations. Um, here in Santa Barbara County, uh, overseeing the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers programs to, to clear our channels and our basins. Um, down in Ventura County, uh, uh, cleaning up the debris from 700 homes uh, that were lost during the Thomas Fire. You know, what we've realized is there's uh, tremendous success based upon the partnerships of local, state, and federal partners and, and the leadership of local officials both during response and into recovery here in Santa Barbara has been uh, tremendous. Um, our team has been engaged uh, on both the disaster response and recovery um, here at the San Santa Barbara EOC and, and working with Matt and his recovery team and will continue to. Um, and as we've uh, worked to ensure that there's an expeditious flow of federal and state dollars uh, for those recovery efforts, you know, we're working on what can we do better to be uh, better prepared for that next event. Um, through the, the, the leadership of the governor and Director Ghilarducci. Um, earlier this year, after the catastrophic debris flow, when we saw additional events uh, coming in, additional weather events, uh, we actually uh, did something we've never done before. We pre-positioned recovery resources. Uh, we mobilized uh, state agency experts from the Department of Water Resources and Caltrans and other agencies, as well as we tasked the federal government with mobilizing the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer contractors in the event that we had another event like the 1-9 flow so that we could expeditiously get in there and clean up debris and get the community back on its feet. Fortunately, those storms didn't manifest the way we thought they were going to, but, but we were prepared for that. Um, additionally, um, as we saw most recently with the fires last week, um, we had the ability uh, through uh, additional funding and legislation that had been authorized to pre-position critical resources to support Santa Barbara County. Um, as was noted, we had through $25 million in funding statewide. Um, we have the ability now to pre-position in coordination with CAL FIRE and local partners critical resource, uh, cr uh, critical uh, firefighting uh, response resources as well as other emergency management resources. Uh, to be prepared when we've got events that meet the critical uh, weather and other uh, threshold factors that are considered. We had five of Cal OES's uh, engines here in Santa Barbara, and as the chief noted, um, were f those engines were first on the holiday fire. At the same time, we had six local government strike, in, uh, strike teams uh, pre-positioned in Los Angeles. Some of those engines ended up getting deployed on additional response up here. and, and because of the, the funding that was available and the program that's in place, we were able to backfill those in the event that a, a, a significant fire had broken in Los Angeles during that time. Um, we were also fortunate during the holiday fire to get a, a federal fire management assistance grant. Uh, it's probably the fastest approval I've ever seen uh, for a FEMA fire management assistance grant, and I attribute part of that to the fact that it all happened about 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, but we were very fortunate uh, to be able to, to get the federal government's approval on that. Um, while we've been working on the fire side uh, to be uh, fast to need and in, in, uh, being ahead of events, um, we also continue to work on developing standards at the state level. Uh, I know there's, there's legislation uh, that, that's um, uh, being considered. We're trying to be ahead of that by developing standards that can 
coincide with whatever legislation gets passed. Uh, we've formed a committee uh, that's developed a, a draft recommendations um, that are currently under review that, that will establish a standard, a, a, a minimum, a base level uh, for all alert and warning throughout California um, that we can uh, use as a model to especially help jurisdictions that aren't as robust in terms of alert and warning as Santa Barbara and Ventura are. And so a lot of lessons are being learned and best practices being utilized that we've been seeing down here. The final uh, area that I'll touch on that Matt touched on earlier uh, is the state hazard mitigation grant funding. Uh, there's a program after every major uh, presidential disaster where 20% of the overall cost of that disaster gets applied uh, to additional funding that's allocated to the state to provide funding grants to local governments to take steps to mitigate future losses and future disasters. So it's, although uh, this funding is driven by fires, uh, the grants themselves apply for flood mitigation, for fire mitigation, for earthquake mitigation. Across California, through the October disasters and the December dis disaster, we have $371 million. Here in Santa Barbara County, there have been 59 uh, what's called notice of interest that have been submitted to us. We've approved 50 of those, and the county's now working uh, on many of those to submit applications to us. And so we'll continue to provide subject matter expertise to them as they work through that grant development process and look forward to uh, some of those actions being implemented from flood mitigation measures that, that, uh, that, that Matt touched on to fire clearance uh, efforts um, and other flood control measures that'll greatly enhance uh, the ability to reduce loss uh, in a future event. So thank you very much for allowing us to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, up front, thank you, <laughs> Senator Jackson and Assembly Member Lamone for having us here. Uh, I think this could be the, uh, the panel of uh, we're from the state, we're here to help. Um, and and I, I, I say that with a little bit of a joke in my voice, um, only because we, that truly is what we're best uh, here to do, is help your local uh, government officials and your local uh, departments to um, recover from what you've been through. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think it's um, uh, lost on any of you that, that the frequency is, uh, has increased uh, dramatically uh, here in the front country of Santa Barbara County. It's increased in your back country as well. Um, you've had more fires in the last uh, five years uh, on average than, uh, than you have in any period that long uh, or that, of, of that uh, length uh, in the past. So uh, Santa Barbara is not unlike the rest of the state. Um, as Senator Jack Jackson mentioned, uh, climate change is changing the fire environment. And uh, in general, uh, it can be said, no matter where you are in California, uh, every acre can and will burn at some point. And we're just seeing more frequent and larger uh, displays of that uh, as we are. So with that, uh, where are we with uh, the new normal? Uh, the new normal is the normal. Uh, and so we're, we are, uh, changing that vernacular within our, our department uh, because new normal, that was good two years ago. Uh, this year and going forward, we're at a point where this is the normal and uh, the state uh, has through, through much of the effort of, of uh, your officials up here on the stage but also on the backs of, of you and the local um, elected officials has, have made a, a astronomical investment in the future of, of the fire services uh, in general in California. Uh, Cal Fire for sure is, is uh, working hard to meet the, the expectations of the funding that has been uh, pushed in our direction uh, through uh, increasing our, um, the readiness of our fleet. Uh, we've increased some numbers of, of firefighting uh, uh, capable resources, both human and, uh, and uh, equipment. Uh, we're increasing our, our 
commitment to our environmental planner types who will be helping with our uh, in CEQA clearance for um, fuels reduction work and prescribed fire. And let me just give you some of the, the, uh, the numbers uh, so you can uh, reference these going forward. And you can, you can pull these out of the, the uh, governor's executive order uh, for forest management, uh, but also um, some of the, the numbers of, of dollars that have, are coming out of, of uh, um, the current budget. Uh, $16 million uh, worth of uh, replacement for equipment uh, vehicles that we've been sorely needing and, and behind on replacement of, so we'll be up, upgrading our, our fleet. Um, uh, Ten million dollars in community-based fire prevention work. That's going to be coming directly down to the ground level and for uh, communities to draw on uh, through their local uh, county fire and or CAL FIRE units to, to uh, work on Local based, again, this is for us to help you help yourselves to become more resilient uh, in protection of your communities uh, from wildfire and other disasters. Uh, there are going to be um, six fi uh, fuels management crews that the state is, is uh, going to hire and have as a permanent um, piece of our, our uh, arsenal. And they are not going to be fire going crews. They're going to be trained to fire going standards, and they will react if there's a fire locally. But their whole mission for those six crews is going to be fuels work. And so that's something that we're going to be doing throughout the state. And where there's a critical need, uh, we will move those crews into those areas and do those projects and then uh, respond accordingly and, and retract accordingly uh, with regard to fires. Their last year's budget had $200 million worth of, of uh, fuels management uh, dollars that has now uh, almost all been allocated to large-scale projects across California. Uh, we have been uh, getting grant money for fuels project work in the hundreds of thousands to several million dollars uh, per year and targeting those to uh, places where they have been needed. These are going in large chunks to large landscape level projects to do watershed level work. And so uh, some, some of those funds will be coming uh, to the local area here and will be uh, touching every, uh, every part of California. This year, an additional $160 million to, is going into the same program. So between last year and this year, $360 plus million dollars are going to fuels uh, related work to uh, help uh, toward mitigating the, uh, the forest health issues, but also the, the fuels issues around communities. The um, other parts of the executive order uh, point toward increasing the pace and scale of, of uh, work on the landscape uh, to reduce fuels. Uh, we are currently doing an average of approximately 250,000 acres of, of project work across the state. We will uh, be increasing that to approximately a half million acres. Um, if you look at that as a whole, uh, it's, it's not enough on the, on the entire statewide basis. But uh, the federal government, Forest Service and uh, federal agencies are committing to an additional half million acres. It's one million uh, per year that we're looking at moving toward uh, over the next several years. The, uh, we're going to be doing more education and outreach and certifying more individuals and uh, departments in prescribed in use of prescribed fire. We're going to be looking at uh, the liability issue of that and f figuring out ways that we can work towards shared liability uh, in some fashion under a, a controlled setting and uh, streamlining the permitting process to get from a planned burn or project to uh, the work being done on the ground. The, the governor uh, enacted a tree mortality task force, or I'm sorry, tree mortality task force that was last year last three years. 
that has morphed into the forest management task force forest management task force is going to be working with all uh, all of the state agencies and our federal counterparts to do all of these things that I mentioned previously but to to collaboratively um, come to a point where we're we're speaking with one voice uh, in moving toward uh, more resilient more resilient forests and more resilient uh, communities and you've heard me say forest several times forest is what we have behind you um, if you think of forest like the forest service calls their forest uh, we have a lot of acres of forest that are in southern california that have no trees on them but that is still is forest so uh, when i'm when i'm saying these and and uh, working through some of these issues that that we are going to be working through over the next several years and possibly decades um, think of the forest as everything that's out your back door and know that we only control and uh, have the, the um, ability to work on those private lands that are between us and the federal government, but also know that the federal lands managers are committed to working with us to move forward on, on the things that we need to to have resilient forests, watersheds, and communities. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Senator Jackson, Assembly Member Lamon, thank you for the opportunity for us to be here tonight and putting this together. Uh, my name is Dave Edwards. I'm the Chief of the Claim Services Bureau of the Department of Insurance. My team is responsible for assisting survivors with their insurance claims and disputes. Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones was able to visit Santa Barbara County a number of times earlier this year and wanted me to convey his continued commitment to using all the powers of his office to assist survivors. First, I'd like to provide the, community, the committee with updated insured loss claims data from the 2017 wildfires as well as the 2018 Montecito mudslide. From October and December 2017, wildfires in Northern and Southern California, more than 53,000 claims have been filed. 7,200 of these have been total loss claims. As of our most recent data, the total insured losses now exceed $12.5 billion. From the December 2017 Thomas Fire alone that impacted Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, more than 9,400 claims have been filed and more than 700 of those were total loss claims. The Thomas Fire is now approaching $2 billion in insured losses. As you know, the Montecito mudslides caused significant property damage and tragic loss of life. More than 2,800 claims have been filed, with more than 150 of these being total loss claims and the total insured losses from the mudslide now exceeds $650 million. Now this data is from homeowners, commercial, and auto insurers of the private market. It does not include any claims that have been filed under the flood program. Now I'd like to provide a, a brief summary of what Commissioner Jones and the department have been doing since the onset of these terrible events. In the Northern and Southern California fires, Commissioner Jones and the department took a number of immediate steps to help effective residents and communities. Uh, he signed orders that cut through the red tape, allowing insurance companies to move more quickly to provide advance payments to help residents get the resources they need to start the recovery and rebuilding process. We mobilized our disaster response teams to pro provide service to wildfire survivors. We issued notices to make sure that insurance professionals, including profession, uh, public adjusters, insurers, and claims adjusters, were reminded of their obligations to know and follow all laws pertaining to claims settlement including the California Unfair Practices Act, the Fair Claims Settlement Practice Regs, and additional consumer protections that supersede standard policy language when there's a declared disaster, such as was the case with these fires and the mudslide. In addition, our consumer services team was deployed to local assistance centers, providing one-on-one -on -one support for thousands of fire survivors. Our investigators and detectives from our enforcement branch teamed up with the Contractors State License Board and local district attorneys to attend town hall meetings, visit affected neighborhoods, and to educate residents on how to avoid scam artists that prey on disaster victims after the disaster occurs. Commissioner Jones issued a notice to insurance carriers asking them to waive the requirements of a detailed home inventory for policyholders and to pay up to 100% of the contents coverage so that fire uh, survivors who experienced a total loss could be spared the painful task of trying to remember and list every item they owned. 
the insurers that agreed to comply with our request made up more than 98 percent of the total loss claims fi filed as a result of the 2017 wildfires. Regarding the January mudslides, Commissioner Jones toured the impacted uh, locations. We deployed our disaster response teams to the areas to assist people at the local assistance centers. We also held town hall meetings and workshops to assist as many survivors as possible. In January of this year, after hearing that some insurance companies were advising their insureds that mudslide damage was not covered under the homeowner policy, Commissioner Jones issued a notice to all property insurers. This notice reminded insurers of the efficient proximate cause doctrine, which is California law. Their duty was to cover damages from the recent mudslides and debris flows if it was determined that the Thomas fire was the efficient proximate cause of the mudslides. The preliminary and subsequent information showed that the Thomas fire, which was a covered peril, was the efficient proximate cause of the subsequent mud flow, uh, mudslide and debris flows. Therefore, we do expect insurers to cover these claims under the property owner's homeowner's insurance policy, as well as under commercial policies in most cases. We understand that for those whose homes are covered under the National Flood Insurance Program, their claims may be completely or partially covered under those policies as well. The department held several one-on-one -on -one workshops that allowed survivors the opportunity to speak with department claims experts in a private session. On the Central Coast, those workshops were held in February, both in Ventura and Santa Barbara, and again in April in Santa Barbara. We met with hundreds of survivors during those workshops. In all, Commissioner Jones and, our, and my staff met with more than 5,000 survivors statewide in these various venues. After meeting with fire survivors across the state and having heard firsthand the challenges they were facing, Commissioner Jones directed the Department of Insurance to develop a package of proposed statutory changes to strengthen the law in this area. The department sponsored and drafted several bills that would assist current and future survivors of wildfires and other disasters with their recovery. Several, several of these bills are still active, and it is our hope that they will be enacted in as strong a form as possible. Some statistics. To date, the department has received 462 consumer requests for assistance or complaints relating to the October and December wildfires. Many of these cases are under investigation still, but so far through our intervention, we have been able to recover more than $40 million for survivors. For the Thomas fire, the department received 84 consumer requests for assistance, and so far we have been able to recover $4 million for the Thomas wildfire survivors. For the Montecito mudslides, the department has not received a large number of complaints, especially after Commissioner Jones issued his January notice advising insurers of the efficient proximate cause doctrine. We've received about 20 complaints. I would like to say that if any member of the public has suffered a loss from the mudslides, please file your claim with your insurance company. If that claim is denied or even delayed, please contact the department and file a request for assistance. Now, last week, the department received two specific questions from committee staff. I would like to address those questions. The first question involves insureds who do not feel that their insurer is providing adequate compensation for their claim. We were asked, what would your office suggest they do next to rebut the insurance company's offer? Are there resources that either your office or another entity can offer to guide individuals through this process? In the case where an insured is at an impasse with their insurer and feels they are not, they are not being fairly compensated, we would ask that you immediately contact the department so we may assign the case to an insurance compliance officer who can seek to resolve the dispute. Our department staff have the expertise to resolve many of these disputes, and if there is an issue that, we cannot, uh, that cannot be resolved through our direct intervention, the department administers a statutory disaster mediation program. Under that program, a survivor may wish to enter into mediation where we assign an outside mediator to seek resolution of the claim dispute issue. This mediation program is free for a consumer. It is non-binding. So if the consumer is not happy with the suggested settlement, the consumer may walk away and pursue other remedies. At the conclusion of this hearing, a member of my team will be in the back of the auditorium with brochures that describe the mediation program. The second question we were asked, uh, in, it seemed to imply that some insurers are delaying mudslide damage claims in order to wait for a report or updated FEMA maps. The question also suggested that updated FEMA maps may be used and impact future insurance rates and premiums in the area of the mudslide. 
The department is not aware of any insurer that is waiting on a FEMA report or updated map to or in order to investigate, evaluate, or settle either a wildfire or mudslide claim. We have received no complaints that any insurer is delaying settlement of claims waiting for a report or updated map. If there is a constituent that is experiencing a delay by their insurer on the, this basis, they should immediately contact us. The question also refers to the possible readjustment of insurance rates. Insurance rates are regulated by the department under very strict standards. An insurer may not automatically raise rates and therefore individual insurance, uh, insurance premiums without first submitting a new rate filing with the department's rate regulation branch. That filing must then be approved by the department. Therefore, we do not expect there to be any immediate rate premium impact as a result of new reports or mapping of the Montecito area. However, the department will obtain and review any reports or maps that are prepared. Lastly, for any type of insurance issue or dispute, if any member of the public is having difficulty with or just not sure about the advice being given by an insurer, an adjuster, an agent, or a broker, please contact our consumer services team toll free at 1-800-927-4357. Or you can visit us online at insurance.ca.gov. Now, we can't resolve all the issues or disputes that are brought to our attention, but we certainly cannot help if we're not contacted. This concludes my testimony. For any of those who would like the department to review their case, an officer of my team is in the back of the room afterwards to provide our request for assistance forms. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. This has been helpful. Uh, the Senator and I are going to give a brief legislative update in terms of what each of us um, and what the state has been working on. And then following that, we will open it up for public comment. So I hope that you've all been taking notes and keeping your questions together. Uh, Sacramento has been particularly busy uh, in, in response to the natural fires. Uh, the Senator and I have not only met with our colleagues that represent some of the most impacted uh, areas in Northern California um, on a periodic basis to discuss um, a collective effort in terms of moving forward, but there have been many members um, in the legislature who have proposed a series of bills. Uh, we have a list, um, and for those of you who may want it, you can, you can get it at the back of the room or um, in the front of uh, the, the hall, um, with over 40 bills that were introduced in uh, this legislative year that relate to natural disaster response and recovery. I think that some of our panelists um, in this last panel have alluded to the fact that some of those bills are still alive, some of those bills um, are no longer in play. Uh, and a few of those bills have been introduced by the both of us. Um, we have been working together on uh, the bills that we're moving forward. One of the bills um, that, uh, I co that I authored and have the senator as a co-author is uh, an Office of Emergency Service translation bill. We know, um, we heard loud and clear, as did Northern California, uh, how important it was to get timely information out um, for the state, in a state that represents over 44% of individuals who speak a language other than English in their home, um, and that is something that we are working on. Unfortunately, a bill that we, that we did start to work on, um, but that did not make it um, all the way was a consolidated debris removal program. What you have all experienced in terms of the services with uh, consolidated debris removal is something that is not law. It, it tends to happen. Um, because we work on it to make it happen, um, but that is not a law, and we are working um, and will look likely revisit it in the coming years. Um, but that is a bill that died. Um, bills die in a number of six to eight different processes, and they can die in different ways. Um, and so that was one of them. Uh, we did have actually uh, the, ch the Cal Fire chief mention one of the bills um, that we authored, which is the Fire Prevention Activities Local Assistant Grant Program um, that has. Uh, over $10 million to create a, a new fire prevention working group composed of representatives and stakeholders from state agencies, local government, uh, academia, interest, industry, and nonprofits that have experience um, and are involved in state fire prevention. Uh, this bill is a working group uh, with the grant program uh, to identify what those methods are. Uh, those are some of them. I know that we additionally have some budget uh, work that we've, we've, uh, we've been able to successfully get to our communities. I think that you've heard both from the local group and the state um, representatives um, that some of those uh, funds include uh, 
uh, backfill for property taxes for both Ventura and Santa Barbara County, uh, backfill for attendance related loss uh, with school districts, um, and that's specific to K-12 and community college uh, school districts. We do have uh, as well as um, some uh, some match money for the associated uh, debris removal for both Ventura and Santa Barbara County as well. Um, so those are some of the efforts I think uh, that we've engaged in. Everything we've done, as the Senator has said, we've done together, not just um, because we represent the district, but we've also done it with colleagues um, in Northern California and colleagues in the state legislature as well. Uh, and I, I would say that it's, um this whole circumstance with the Thomas fire was somewhat prescient. Um, uh, I, ha I chair the uh, Joint Committee on Emergency Management uh, and have been very actively involved in this issue since I was elected to the Senate. I chaired it for the first session, which is two years. I was the vice chair last year and the chair this year. And it so happened that on December 4th, uh, I was chairing a, a committee meeting on the early alert systems. Uh, having gone up to Northern California and uh, had my first helicopter experience in one of those really clunky old National Guard helicopters that ended up causing me to have problems with my uh, neck. If you've never written in a helicopter, you're not missing anything, uh, especially, especially I think Vietnam War era uh, uh, type uh, helicopters. At any rate, riding in a helicopter and seeing an area called Coffee Park. I don't know if uh, you've all seen that, the photo of this place uh, in Santa Rosa. This is a community of uh, several thousand homes that were totally destroyed by that fire up in Santa Rosa where uh, we lost about, I think, eight or 9,000 homes and uh, about 43 lives, 44 lives. And so it was clear that we had a problem with our emergency alert systems. They, they were not working. Uh, this fire came very quickly. It all sounds familiar because it is familiar. And so I was finishing up a hearing on December 4th on these emergency alert systems and uh, talking about the fact we really needed to shore this whole process up. Our 9-11 system, 40 years old. I mean, basically before the internet. Um, our Universal alert systems, well, they go too far and not specific enough. And many of you during the Thomas fire probably got that two o'clock in the morning alert telling us to evacuate, except what they're really trying to do is tell people in Carpinteria to evacuate. So our systems clearly uh, needed work. So I banged the gavel down at five o'clock and said sort of um, boastfully, well, it's December, uh, hopefully our fire season is, is pretty well behind us. It'll give us a few months to really try to come to grips with this and, and get moving to try to correct it going forward. An hour and a half later, the Thomas fire started in December. Absolutely unheard of that we would have a fire of that magnitude in December that burned for 40 days and we all experienced what that, that created. So I have done a bill that uh, authorizes, it's SBA 21, it's an emergency notification bill. What we discovered, and it's the same problem we're still having today in our community. People do not sign up. Now, granted, we had some problems in Goleta. People did sign up and didn't get noticed. We'll deal with that problem. Uh, believe me, we will deal with that problem. But the fact is, people aren't signing up. Well, you know, you go on Google and you get signed up for all sorts of stuff that you don't want to be signed up for. So how about a system where the county can, at its discretion, assign people up to get these emergency alerts by using information based upon your utility bills. We know where people live and we know even if their phone numbers aren't reflective of an 805 area. So the people will get notice and if they don't want to be part of it, they can opt out. But it is an opt-in system and um, uh, I do believe that we have a lot of support on that from our public safety people. You know, the job to alert people is uh, the job of law enforcement, and I do know that almost all our law enforcement in California supports that. Um, it was mentioned the debris flow, the, um, uh, ex uh, the uh, efficient proximate cause issue. That is a law, California, but it's, in, it's not actually in statute. It's the case law that has come down. So basically, there is absolutely no doubt that the uh, Thomas fire was the cause of the debris flow. 
and I don't know that there are any insurance companies at this point in time that are denying that, but they're sort of hanging back a little bit from what I gather. And when I was here in January, you gave me a list of those companies that were a problem, and they're still marked in big bold letters and red ink on my notebook, and I've, I'm going after those companies to pay up. But um, this is a, a bill I'm doing, SB 917. It's going to actually put this into statute so that there's no way these companies can get around it. I'll tell you, it's very interesting. They are trying very hard to undermine my ability to get this bill passed, um, but I am determined. And then the, the last item I wanted to mention was a bill, SB 1260, the Fire Prevention and Protection Bill, which I have authored, again, in part because of the experience that we've had throughout the state in the fact that it, what they didn't mention is that currently California now has 138 million dead trees, which are about as flammable as anything you can imagine. Now, and they're not all up in the forests in Northern California. And th it's almost impossible to try to cut down all these trees. But what we can do, and one of the things that this bill does, and uh, Chief Peterson mentioned it sort of obliquely, but um, we, don't, we haven't been doing any burns. We haven't been doing any kind of controlled burns in the state because for a lot of good reasons. But you know what? We've got to start doing these controlled burns. And we're going to do them as protectively as possible. We've brought this bill, includes the air quality control districts to, to be part of this discussion. But if you inhaled those fumes for 40 days, as many of us did, this is not healthy. And we need to do better to manage our forests. And that's what SB 1260 does, using the experts. You, you saw some of them here with OES. You saw them locally, um, dealing with the fact that we have a wildlife-urban interface. We call it the WUI, which is um, different than the forests up in Northern California. Uh, it's a very different, the chaparral is different, uh, and what we're doing is bringing together these experts to figure out a plan to try to thin the forests, to thin the area so that we don't end up standing there watching helplessly and with great trauma as that fire moved from Santa Paula all the way to the back country uh, in, uh, in Montecito in Santa Barbara. We've got to do better. That is part, that is the uh, the curse of the climate change that we're experiencing is those droughts, the bark beetles, the things that are destroying uh, our forests, destroying our chaparral, and we have got to address that problem. So that's SB 1260. The governor put $160 million into the budget this year for this long-term forest health and wild uh, wildfire resiliency, including uh, money for, we estimate about $120 million will go for this. So the state is putting money in. Um, we ha are working collaboratively, and I think OES undervalues itself here. The county has never really experienced anything like this before, but OES has, the Office of Emergency Services for the state. So coming together, working in the um, um, emergency management program with, uh, with Rob uh, and, and the others who have dealt with some fires. I mean, we, we are somewhat experienced in them here in California and, in, and locally. But this was an event that uh, was so complex um, that, that uh, Mark Iladucci, who's the head of the Office of Emergency Services, who was a rock star, um, so, had worked with uh, Jamie Lee. Uh, what's his name, Jamie? Jamie Lee Witt, who was uh, double, also a rock star. Um, it's, in all the years, the 25 years that uh, he's been working on fires, he said this is the most complex uh, event he has ever experienced. So bringing together this collaborative effort with the state, with the feds, FEMA was there for us. Um, we got a huge amount of money. Uh, again, money is critical because if we have to take money for these fires that we could and should be using for a variety of services within this community, uh, we are uh, going to really be uh, unduly strapped and just uh, n never able to dig out of this hole. So um, I'm going to let my colleague here uh, take it over from here. I think we do have questions. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the staff that's here. We've got some sergeants here from Sacramento. I want to uh, give a particular thanks to Fernando Ramirez, who is my staff, a native uh, Santa Paulan who is, uh, works for me in the Capitol and helped put this all together. I know Monique's staff has been uh, working very hard in this. And to all of you for being here, thank you, thank you. We will get through this. It's going to be tough, 
but heck, we're Santa Barbara County, we can do anything. And likewise, I want to give thanks, Jimmy Ritrock, I have Yane Lopez, Stephanie Ramirez Sarate, Samantha Osuna, several folks who are here who have been working. Um, when the Senator and I are in Sacramento, which is on a regular basis every single week, we do have team members who are here, um, who are the voice and the ears um, when we cannot be here. So it, thanks to everyone. What we would like to do is we have set up a microphone um, here at the front um, for public comment. Again, this was the opportunity for us to bring a taste of what our Sacramento hearings are like to the local community. So this is your opportunity to get a public comment into legislative record. It can also be a question. If we have the capacity to answer a question, we may or may not have the capacity to answer questions. Um, we can try to answer those questions. But again, this is the opportunity for you uh, to get anything you'd like into the legislative record. And please state your name, um, first name and last name. And thank you. Thank you. My name is Denise Spangler Adams. I'm here on to representing two different groups. One's the 23 homeowners on uh, Montecito Vista off Barker Pass Road. Our first question is um, related to the county and how uh, to get our first responders to live in the community because there's fear with the road closure. So many of our first responders live outside of the area. Our second concern is that we attended a Montecito Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors hearing. Joe Cole, who's here with us today, and Chief Hickman, we heard the professional consultant's report about backburning as per Senator Jackson and thank you for Senate Bill 1260. However, at that hearing, there was agreement and a recommendation that since there had not been a fire since 1933, there should be back burning. And there were countless environmentalists who then went to the Board of Supervisors. They don't live in Montecito, and then we're the sufferers. So our, our concern is that while we appreciate 1260, we had the benefit of that expertise from professionals in a paid consulting report. We lack governance in Montecito, so our planning commission listened to our chief, but then nothing happened, and as you see, we had a major fire. So one of our concerns as legislators, how do we prevent that from happening again where our local area says we need back burning, we have a paid fire department, but then as it goes up the ladder, we're put into peril. I speak to you in our neighborhood, we've been through three fires in nine years, evacuated three times, huge cost to families resulting in divorces, uh, children that are adversely affected, and we, we welcome uh, legislation to prevent it. Our other question is, we'd like to see legislation so that when donors give money, we have several neighbors who are willing to give significant amounts and did, but the donations somehow went into a black hole. We would like to see that local giving stay local so that there's some accountability and transparency. We have neighbors in my community very concerned that doctors, nurses, lawyers, teachers who were adversely infected by the mud flow needed to get the boulders removed. People were willing to give, but they didn't know where their money went. So if there's anything you can do for in the area of transparency, local donors. Some of the money went to Santa Barbara City College, but some went to United Way, Red Cross, and then people stopped giving who were willing to give more to help families, but there was no accountability or transparency. And then our last question was, how will pending legislation help the people in this room? We understand going forward you have great ideas, that, that the extension on our temporary living expenses, what have you. But under contract law, our understanding from meeting with independent insurance adjusters and with attorneys, it, it, and Senator Jackson, you know this best, being an attorney, which I'm not, you can't go retroactive, it would be going forward. People in this room are concerned and we've found that all different insurance companies, there's all different contracts, but again, to, to help a community heal, we'd like to see something, it might, might not be possible, to help them. And if it can't 
be retroactive, then again through donations where we can ensure that the people who lived here before the debris flow and the fire can return to our community. And then our goal is to make sure that our first responders live on this side of wherever the road closure may be so that when something happens, we can have all those firefighters, nurses, doctors, whoever we need, law enforcement officers in our community. Thank you for your time. Well, let, let me try to answer, that was a lot of very good questions. Uh, first responders living on, in on this side of the hill, that's a housing issue, that's a real challenge. What we did here was the prepositioning. So you get this red flag alert, and I remember Friday evening I was headed toward Carpinria and saw all these OES trucks, uh, um, trucks from Long Beach, got, got fire trucks, who had prepositioned here. So. Um, until the housing issue is a, a sort of a battle on its own, um, but certainly it would be very helpful if people were able to live here, but that's an issue that I think is going to take a bunch of time to, to resolve. And I just wanted it, to add all the vacant houses in Montecito, like in my neighborhood, there are six on my street. All the people said they would offer their homes to first responders to make sure they could stay here because we know hotels become a commodity. We're in Woodland Hills, we're in Timbuktu. But maybe we could have a central place where people who have three, four, eight bedroom homes, they were willing to make them available, but we didn't know who to call, what to do. So that's just Good a suggestion. Good point. Perhaps the county can have uh, something uh, available to it in terms of short-term or mid-term housing for first responders. Uh, as far as donors, um, uh, that's a challenge. I know United Way, Red Cross, they accept contributions uh, that go for all the services. So probably the money that was spent putting in some of these facilities here was money that others had given previously. Uh, I think there can be instances where nonprofits are set up locally for very specific purposes. They just have to create them. And the last thing, um, with uh, the controlled burns and all, uh, my, my measure uh, is designed to um, uh, basically prioritize uh, and th this will allow CAL FIRE to, to prioritize based on risk reduction, and that's part of what this is going to be. They'll uh, work with all stakeholders to plan the fuel reduction in the least impactful way, um, including the impact to the environment. But the bottom line is um, the choice is between a controlled small burn or an uncontrolled big wildfire. And obviously, we have got to go for the former rather than the latter. That's the reason I've done the bill. And I think that, uh, I think we all recognize, again, with the nature of these fires, we have got to do more controlled burns, but the, and intelligently. So that's my hope. Did you have anything you want to say? The, the uh, you know, and, and we agree. I think that the, a couple things that I'd like to add in terms of the housing situation, while there are temporary things that we can do for short-term and, and um, midterm housing options for first responders. Um, this November, uh, California will see a couple ballot initiatives that deal with housing. And um, if it is the hope of this community to see a long-term solution, when local communities, whether it's county or city, are developing housing plans and have housing initiatives, um, I would highly suggest that that voice be a, a voice that's out there. We talk about affordable housing, housing for veterans, um, and if housing for first responders is something that the community wants, we may have that opportunity to think about this in the long term. While we experienced it, um, for the Thomas fire and for the debris flows, it's not the first time we've experienced it. We also experienced it for the La Conchita mudslides. Um, and we, ha we have consistently seen that first responders, um, and also um, education pro you know, professionals, uh, health professionals, um, are not living in the communities where they work. And this is one of the long-term consequences of individuals who cannot afford to live in the communities they work. Uh, so I will say that we will have, um, as community, the opportunity to address this if we go to our cities and also to um, our counties. And when housing projects are being built, um, ask, is there an opportunity to include X amount of units in this particular project for first responders, which is considered workforce housing. Um, so I, I will add that, and I think that that's something that we can definitely think of um, as well in the future um, in terms of that. As someone um, who chairs the select committee for the nonprofit sector, there's definitely room to keep having conversations about donations and how we keep donations local and how we ensure that there's a network um, that is able to provide information 
uh, to our local community about where local donations are going. Uh, so I, I just wanted to add those pieces. I, I don't know if anyone in the county wants to, okay. And we'll go on to the next question or comment, and I think we have someone here, and then. My name is Cindy Marcus, and I want to address your um, issue of people signing up for the Aware and Prepare. I am signed up for all of them, and I was getting loads of alerts, and, but in the 1-9 debris flow, there was no phone service, no landline service, no cell phone service, and I was dependent on that. I, I was waiting for the alert <laughs> to know what to do, and once the phone service went out, there was no alert. We had no power, we had no gas, no water, no nothing. So is there something to do in that circumstance? So, um, yes. Um, and part of this hearing that I was doing on December 4th was to address the fact that our wireless services do nothing or very little. Um, they've got to uh, be um, present in this discussion because very fewer and fewer people are having landlines. I had a landline, and, but it didn't work either. Right. And so, uh, I mean, landlines weren't working um, or people were getting notices that were not accurate. Um, we need to do, we need to create a 21st century technologically appropriate warning system. Back in the old days, the warning was the church bells. We don't have that anymore, but we do have technology that should be as effective, if not more effective. There's geofencing that they're talking about now. There's all sorts of GPS type um, options, uh, but the private sector, the profit-driven private sector is not particularly interested in this. Um, we've got to get their interest, and we're trying to work on that. Yes. First a comment, and then some comments and questions. George Bush, New Orleans, Hannah Beth Jackson, Monique Lamone, and Das Williams, Montecito. Elections make a difference. And I thank you all for your participation. My first question is monitoring equipment was mentioned of being installed. Uh, I'm curious what the logistics on that is. I do not think this is the appropriate time or place for that since it sounds like it might be quite extensive. But I'm hoping that you could schedule a hearing in the appropriate communities so that public comment like me with wacky ideas uh, can come forth and present my wacko ideas. Uh, for example, like, you know, the oil separation uh, could be done by centrifugal force rather than, you know, nettings that don't work. Uh, second of all, uh, I've heard a lot about property owners and government, but I have not heard anything about renters. I'm a member of the Rental Housing Mediation Board for the City of Santa Barbara. What's going on with renters? You know, how are they being assisted? What's, what's going on with that? Here's my wacko idea. I've watched the planes go into the lake and dip, scoop up water, go to the fire scene and dump it. It seemed to be a, a little more ineffective than me trying to put out the fire in my fireplace by spitting on it. What I'm thinking is, would it not be cheaper to have a long tube, uh, even though it's five miles long, that could deliver fire hydrant force and volume uh, that local you know, household water supplies cannot. So I, I lay that, I mean, Boy, those guys sure could use a lot of water at the scene of the fire, and I think it could make a significant difference if we could transfer the water that's in the lake to the fire expeditiously. Thanks. Thank you. And, you know, the, this uh, group, the Montecito uh, uh, group, whose name I'm... Um, the Resiliency Committee, I'm sure, would be delighted to hear some of your comments. Well, that's it. I mean, it's just a brainstorm, and, you know, I'm not an engineer or have no qualifications to back up uh, other than being wacko uh, with, with the idea. Th th thank you, and I do wanna say, um, I I'm referencing the document we have about all the bills that were introduced, and one of those bills that was introduced by a colleague in the assembly, Assemblymember Wood, um, was AB 1990. 
and the bill prohibits price gouging of the rental housing that was not on the market at the time of the proclamation or declaration of an emergency. And so currently the law exists for uh, property that was on the market um, during the time. And so this is an expansion um, of uh, protection for renters. So I wanted to mention that and that bill is currently in Senate appropriation, so it's still alive. Well, I encourage you to encourage your staff to contact the Rental Housing Mediation Board um, Ms. Bifano, and uh, see if you can coordinate and get some kind of notice put on your publications that this is a service that is available. And I encourage Das Williams to put the county on the contract. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lawrence Thompson, our local architect. And since th uh, 2013, I've been in liaison with County Fire on the idea of putting a fire helicopter operation right near Montecito. Because we have over 100 miles between San Inez and the Ventura County operations, and it takes them typically over a half an hour with their 10 minute uh, launch time to get down here. Whereas we have put together an operation that would launch in four minutes and be probably anywhere in Montecito within, t within 10, maybe even eight minutes. The difference, of course, is light years in terms of fire growth. Obviously, with the Thomas fire being so well developed, it wouldn't have made much difference other than augmenting the effort. But as with the recent uh, holiday fire and other fires that are due to sundowners, which need immediate response, it would make a terrific difference. The problem we're having is money. The county does not have the money, and I understand that, and of course, even the fire departments who are, operate tremendous effort, uh, they need more money just to do what they're doing now. <clears throat> so this is the problem, and I have one individual who would come up with a half a million dollars cash toward this $1.8 million a year project, uh, but I'd have to match to get him to bring that money in. The question is, is there anything such at the state level? Is there anything in terms of the insurance companies who have contacted who could join together to help augment this? We have how many hundred billion dollars worth of real estate here? And yet we have our the helicopters in San Inez. That's, it's very responsible. We have a big county and they're right in the middle. But as with the Jesuita fire, they weren't in the base at that time. And by the time the helicopters got there, the wind was too strong, they couldn't do anything. But the response time was like 90 minutes. That's a light year. So my, my frustration is, even though uh, Chief Peterson has given me a kind letter <coughs> supporting this is, are there other agencies out of the county that could help augment this and bring this to a point where the, the enormous uh, preponderance of, wor of worth in terms of property exists. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I look at uh, our fire folks um, in, in the back and um, I, I welcome them if they want to respond. I do want to describe a little bit about how state funding works and when we've been able to share with you uh, some additional funding that has been brought by the state um, we have worked with the county to identify the priorities. Um, we work with cities, with counties, with our municipalities to identify what the priorities are. And certainly our requests have been greater than what we've been able to um, bring to you. But um, this does become a challenge for us that we are looking at where, we're, where we are at and also the direction that's being given to us um, at the local level as well in terms of what those priorities are. If that was something that was a priority for the county, uh, for the city, it does mean there's trade-offs. There is nothing that is done without trade-offs. Um, we would, you know, welcome to have that conversation, um, but that is something that we would have to um, really work with the county and the cities to understand where does it fall in terms of the priority. It has been made clear to us by, uh, I think, our local municipalities that the priority at this moment is um, immediate recovery. Um, Long-term or mid-term planning uh, is something that we're trying to get to, but our, our communities have made it very clear that some of the backfill um, related to so much that has been lost here is, is the immediate priority. 
Um, I don't know if anyone, I think that this is where we're at, certainly um, if there are agencies, whether it's a public-private pri uh, partnership that are willing to explore it, um, we would be happy to think about that um, and connect those agencies should we identify them. Yeah, I think these are all very uh, excellent suggestions. If we have people who are willing to contribute but they want to make sure the money is going where they want it to go and where it's appropriate to go, um, we, again, the whole notion of public-private partnerships is where we have to go both statewide and federally as the, you know, as the public uh, trough gets less and less on the federal level because of all these tax giveaways, the reduction of the ability of our federal government to provide services is only going to increase. Uh, the state has had a pretty good run recently, but the economy, what goes up will come down. So if there are some suggestions, and then again, coordinating with our um, first responders, they know best what is the most efficient use of those dollars, but it's a conversation absolutely worth having. And we had this one woman here who was, wanted to come on up. Don't, don't be shy. My name is Lee Ann Palmer. I'm actually a Goleta resident. Um, first, I'd like to thank the first responders for Friday night. It was not anything like this, but it wasn't good. Um, in a poll of over 50 of my neighbors on the neighborhood, out in the area directly affected, as well as coworkers that live all over town, we did not receive any alerts. We were all signed up. Now, the one change that has happened since we all signed up for these things is the 805 issue. I wonder if anyone has investigated with however that worked, because when I signed back up, as did all my neighbors after we got done evacuating and coming back home, and I know it was small compared to what Montecito went through, but it could have been worse. I wonder if anyone has investigated if that affected us, because the only thing that came through to me was Newshawk, and I got every single thing over this fire, the Whittier fire, everywhere. So I wonder about that. And the second comment I have is, I'm old enough to remember, and most of the people in this room, the emergency broadcast system test with the obnoxious noise that used to come over the TV. Has anyone ever considered, before we have the next disaster, to test the reverse 911, the Nixley, the Santa Barbara County, do a test, notify everybody we're going to do a test, and see what happens? Because you don't find the holes until the people are scrambling around in the dark trying to figure out what happened. So since you are on that committee, maybe we can implement this, and maybe if we have another disaster, our community will get timely notice. Thank you. Yes, I um, uh, pulled out the article uh, that Tyler Hayden wrote, uh, I guess it was yesterday, um, very distressing. Um, and uh, I'm sure the county is going to take a very deep dive into that, and I will as well, because um, there's really um, not, no excuse for, for that. Fortunately, no one was killed. Um, the sheriff's office did go door to door, which I think helped, did not go to your door. Well, I have friends that live on North Fairview in the and area. I lost, have friends who lost their homes Nobody went door to door. People fled, basically. Well, there was no way for them to get up there to go door to door. The immediate neighborhood south of Cathedral Oaks, there were no deputies going door to door. They were doing the best they can, but they can't go door to door that fast. Well, I, I think that we will be taking a very hard look at this. I think your suggestion has merit to it as well. We do have the technology today. We just have to apply it. And I think those are all very good questions, and thank you for that. Thank you. Any last questions? OK. Come on down. 
Hello, my name is Jeff Harms. I'm at 1247 East Valley Road. I'm a landscape architect. Um, I have a question regarding forest management. Um, I think that it's something that actually hits on a lot of these points here, and I think it's really important. Um, what my question is, is what kind of management are we going to go forward with? You know, we started off with like the Smokey the Bear management. We all kind of know that didn't work. And now we're going to the, um, you know, the weed whacker thing where we're removing everything from the forest. But there are more modern ways of doing it where you do rewilding and different things and they actually are proven to work better. My question is, are we presenting that rather than having a knee jerk reaction as to what we're going to do are we presenting that as let's go forward with a modern way of doing things, of a better progressive way of doing things to make things actually work? And is that part of the legislation? Thank you. I, I thank you for the question. Um, that is actually the bill that um, I am authoring, AB 1956. Um, it's the year-round pr uh, fire prevention act um, that Cal Fire Chief uh, alluded to, and it does bring um, experts um, from academia to industry to uh, first responders to a space to have those conversations, um, not just in terms of what the best practices are in California, but looking at it um, from the world. What have we seen in other areas of the world where, um, whether it's a wildfire or a flood or anything of the kind, what, what are the types um, of, uh, of, of elements that are needed to prevent um, these wildfires. So I, I they, you know, it looks at vegetation management, um, on any related education or outreach, on, um, you know, fire prevention strategies, uh, creating defensible space, uh, retrofitting uh, structures, uh, to, you know, anything that increases fire resistance. And so that is something that um, is going to be a state, it, it is moving forward, the bill is still alive, it still has two more steps. Um, before it gets to the governor's office, um, but we do feel confident that it is something that will establish what we used to have in California, which was a working group, and reestablish it um, in collaboration with a number of other vehicles that are being used. But your points are absolutely well taken, um, that there are a number of strategies that Smokey the Bear was once our image of fire prevention, um, but uh, it is, we have, uh, trust me, we are far beyond Smokey the Bear, who I still love and I think is cute, um, but we are far, far beyond that in terms of the strategies and um, we want to bring that together at the statewide level. And with that, I think we are wrapping up. Thanks. So thank you all very much for coming. Uh, please l share with us your ideas, your thoughts, your concerns. That's the purpose of this meeting today. Um, we are here for you. Uh, please make sure you let us hear from you. And with that, um, thank you for coming. We are adjourned. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate.
This is the California State Senate. 